Thank you very much for for attending. Again, welcome to our home. Um, the lecture and my thoughts tonight will be on a theme called The King in the Field. So if you've been listening to my lectures, I'm sure you've come to the realization that I like to tell stories. I find it interesting that we tell stories to children to put them to sleep, but we tell stories to adults to wake them up. We see that God bothered to include in his Torah many stories. In reality, all the Torah should have been, been like the book of Leviticus, like the book of Ayikra. Do this and, and don't do that. But why all the stories? If you were to tell someone something three times, there's a good chance that they would be a little insulted. They might feel that you think that they're dim-witted. Otherwise, why would you have to repeat yourself and say the same information over again and again? Instead of teaching them or conveying your point, all you would accomplish is to alienate them, and your efforts would be in vain. However, what if, what if you told someone something and then you tell them a story that reinforces uh, your point? Then, after you finish the story, you explain the moral of the story. Well, guess what? You just told them the same thing three times. But instead of insulting them, what you've done is entertained them and taught them something at the same time. Something that they might actually remember. You know, when I became a Balchuva, uh, it's a term used for someone who is returning to a religious lifestyle, I heard a rabbi tell a story about the month of El. The month of El begins a 40-day period of repentance, an introspection that leads us to Yom Kippur, the Day of Judgment. The truth is, <clears throat> I really don't remember exactly the words that he said, but he told a story. The name of the story was The King in the Field. Now, this was the first story that I had ever heard as a Baal Shuva, and it made a real impression on me. As I said, I don't remember the lecture, but I did and still do remember his story. So, in essence, I do remember the gist of his lecture. This is one of the reasons that I became a storyteller. It is a pleasant and interesting way to convey knowledge to anyone and everyone of all ages. After all, we all love hearing a good story. So here we go. There's a story told of a king who was on a hunt. It happened that he spied a magnificent buck, and without thinking, he spurred his horse and took, out, took off after the buck. He didn't realize it, but in his excitement, he had separated himself from the hunting party, and he was now by himself. His only concern, though, was to catch the buck. He chased it deeper and deeper into the forest, and the deeper he went into the forest, the darker it became, and soon he lost sight of the buck. And that is when he finally realized that he was alone and lost deep in the forest. It was already midday, and he was hungry and thirsty, but luckily he found a fresh stream of water. And so he dismounted, and both he and his horse refreshed themselves with its cool water. Well, their serenity was broken when they heard the roar of a bear coming to them from behind the bushes. In a panic, <laughs> both he and the horse began to run, both in different directions. Fortunately for him, the bear took off after the horse but the king just ran deeper into the forest. He had no idea where he was or how to get out of the forest. He just kept running. Now the sun was setting and the king was wandering through the thick brush. He had no idea what direction that he should take, so he just walked. He was uncertain of his fate. He was hungry, tired, and as you can imagine, a bit concerned. He could hear the sounds of the animals in the forest all around him. The sun was setting and it was getting dark. What was he going to do? Suddenly, he reached a clearing, and in the clearing he saw a light coming from a woodsman's hut. He now had some hope. He walked up to the hut of the, pardon, the door of the small hut and knocked on the door. A simple woodsman answered the door, and <laughs> his surprise was quite evident. After all, standing before him was the king. Yes, his royal garments were torn, and he looked weary, but... It was the king. The woodman was confused. He, of course, had had to invite the king into his hut. But it was a woodsman's hut. 
it wasn't a palace. What was he supposed to do with the king in his simple hut? So he welcomed the king into his home graciously, as gracious as he could. He wanted to offer the king a seat, but all he had was one wobbly chair, and it was just some pieces of wood that he had nailed together. So he apologized to the king for the condition of the chair, but he asked the king if he would like to sit. The king managed a weak smile, and he sat down. You know, the woodsman then turned to the king and said, I'm sure that your highness is hungry and thirsty, but all I have is goat's milk and a wooden cup, and that really isn't so clean, and some moldy bread. The king smiled again and said to the woodsman, that goat's milk and a not-so-clean wooden cup and some moldy bread <laughs> would be just fine. The woodsman watched sadly as the king ate the bread and drank the milk. He wished that he could give the king a better meal, but that was all he had. Now, the woodman could see that the king was totally exhausted from his day in the forest. He wanted to offer him a bed to sleep on, but all he had was boards, straw, and rags. So, apologizing to the king again, he said, I'm sure that the king is very tired after your difficult day and that you would like to get some rest. Now, I know the king is used to the finest linens, goose down comforters, and pillows, but I'm sorry, all I can offer you is wooden boards covered with straw and rags. The king smiled again and said that boards covered with straw and rags would be just fine. So, the woodsman arranged a bed for the king, and within minutes, the king was snoring away. Hearing the king in his deep sleep, somehow, made the woodsman feel just a little better. Now, the next morning, the woodsman took the king to the edge of the forest, and as you can imagine, there were search parties all over trying to find the king. When they saw the woodsman and the king together, they quickly took the king and escorted him immediately back to the palace. Of course, the woodsman was totally ignored, which was fine with him. He quietly retraced his steps and returned back to his hut in the woods. Now, the next morning, the serenity of the forest was broken by the sound of a magnificent carriage drawn by six horses and accompanied by a squad of soldiers. The woodsman heard all the commotion and looked out his window to see the carriage and the soldiers. There was a knock on his door, and when he opened it, there stood the captain of the guard in all of his regality. The captain said to the woodsman that he had been sent by the king to bring him to the palace immediately. Well, the woodsman shook his head as if to say he understood why the king had sent his soldiers to bring him to the palace. After all, look what he had done. He had made the king sit on a wobbly wooden chair. He had fed him goat's milk in a dirty cup and moldy bread. Then he made him sleep on boards, straw, and rags. Well, the king was summoning him to punish him, as was proper for his irreverence, the irreverence that he had shown the king. So he was ushered into the throne room where the king and all of his majesty was sitting on his throne. The woodsman bowed his head and waited to hear his fate. To his amazement, he looked up and there was the king, walking towards him with arms extended and a large, warm smile on his face. The king hugged him and began to thank him for all of his kindness and that the woodsman had shown him. The king told the woodsman that he was welcome to live in the palace with the king as his reward for the rest of his life. You know, we have a tradition that starting from the month of Elo, our king, God Almighty himself, is so to speak in the field. During the rest of the year, he sits on his throne of judgment. We can only connect with him with prayers that originate from the depths of our hearts and souls. Not all prayers are pristine enough to be accepted by the angels and then brought before God. However, during the month of Elul, well, God is very approachable. Even if our prayers are not perfect, it is a time when he looks at our transgressions as a father rather than as a king. Those words and thoughts that we present before him Though they may be flawed, during the, this period of time, they are somehow acceptable, even desired. With our prayers, we are able to beseech God to stand up and move over so that he can sit on his throne of mercy 
instead on his, on his throne of judgment, much like the king in our story. As a benevolent father, he wants to forgive us even more than we want his forgiveness. You know, we read in the Torah in the portion of Bullock that ten times in the portion it states the Hebrew words, Malach Hashem, which translates to mean an angel of God. Now, according to the Grah, this corresponds to the ten messages that God sent to Bilaam in this portion. Ten times, and in ten different ways, God tried to save Bilaam from self-destruction. But the evil Bilaam failed to see the messages, just like he failed to see the angel standing in front of him with a drawn sword. On the other hand, we see that Abnovino, Abraham our father, was faced with ten tests from God, and he rose to the occasion every time. So we see, even with Bilaam, a person who personified all the impurities of the world, yet heaven went out of its way to try to stop him from sinning, lest he destroy himself. How much more so will God Almighty aid his own son, the son of the king, a member of the children of Israel, to prevent him from slipping into sin and darkness? based on an ancient by Yeshechel Levenstein. You know, we learn a great lesson from Bilaam. Rashi tells us in the portion of Bullock that the angel that stood in his path with the drawn sword was actually the Satan, Satan. Rashi says on this verse that this was an angel of mercy and he desired to restrain Bilaam from sinning, lest he commit a sin and perish. So from this incident with Bilaam, we see that the Satan, Satan, is really sent to us to help us to receive our reward in the world to come. Now, in the secular world, repentance connects with the concept of turning over a new leaf. This is not how Judaism defines repentance. Now, the Hebrew word for repentance is teshuva, which can be broken up into two words, toshuv, meaning to return, and he, which is an allusion to God Almighty. So we don't agree with the concept of turning over a new leaf. Our focus is on being who we really are at our core, an elevated being with a spark of the divine that resides within each and every one of us. We need only to return to our core to connect the God within us to the God that is outside of us. Now to understand this concept even better, let us look at the Jewish nation when they were redeemed by God from Egypt. Abraham, our father, was told by God that his descendants would spend 400 years as slaves in Egypt. Yet we find that God redeemed them after only 210 years. But why? One reason given is because they had fallen to the 49th level of impurity. Had they fallen to the 50th level, they would have entered into the abyss and then they would have been lost forever. So they, so to speak, forced God's hand and he redeemed them 190 years early. Now the whole purpose of the children of Israel being redeemed from Egypt was so that they could travel to Mount Sinai where they would be receive the Torah from God Almighty himself. But, but there was one problem. In order for them to receive the Torah, they needed to elevate themselves to the 49th level of purity. So, the nation spent the next 49 days working on themselves, moving from one level to the next, day by day. They proceeded on their path until they were able to reach the 49th level of purity. Then, on the 50th day, they merited to receive the Torah from God himself on Mount Sinai. Uh, this is all fine and dandy, but there was really a problem. You see, the children of Israel were on the 49th level of impurity, and they needed to reach the 49th level of purity to merit receiving the Torah on Mount Sinai. So instead of counting 49 days, if you think about it, they really needed to count 98 days, 49 days that would remove the negativity that they acquired in Egypt, and then another 49 days to elevate themselves to the level of being able to merit and accept the Torah from God Almighty himself. Now this can best be understood with a parable. Imagine if you went to a yard sale and you bought a candelabra, 10 bucks. 
The candelabra was black, and when you got home, you cleaned off the dross, the scum that forms on surface of, of molten metal. To your surprise, huh, the blackened candelabra begins to shine. It was silver. Did you make it shine? Nope. All you did was remove the dross, and silver automatically will shine. So too, a Jew, each of us has been given a spark of divinity at birth. This spark is a gift from our benevolent Father in heaven. The spark of divinity automatically makes us shine. When we sin, we allow a spiritual dross to form on our souls. We don't have to create goodness within our souls. It already exists. We just need to remove the dross, the negative impurities that connect to it, returning to God, our essence. You know, there's never a time or place in our lives when we don't need to strengthen our connection to our God. We are living at a time, in a time in history where one might think that things are so good that in reality we really don't need His help. But just the opposite. Somehow in the best of times, we need to connect to our Father in Heaven even more. I'm afraid that the whole world seems to be on, a, on the brink of insanity. You know, the things that we hear and see are, are, are totally without logic and reason. How can it be wrong for someone to say, all lives matter? Or how can those people who live in the inner city want to defund the police? The only thing that stands between them and total tyranny. This is a time of the year when we have God's ear. Let's not waste this opportunity. He is waiting. He is listening. We need to cry out loud to our God. We need to acknowledge that though we have not been the best of children, though we may be lacking in any merit whatsoever, still, we are his children, and we desperately need his help. Somehow we always seem to think that there is plenty of time to get it together. That may not be the case. Now is the time, and there are no guarantees about tomorrow. It seems that all the prophecies about the coming of the Messiah are all around us. Let us open our eyes and see them and say to God that we have been in the Galut, in the exile, for way too long. It's time for Him to redeem us and to rebuild our temple and to return the Shekhinah, the divinity of God, back to its proper place with the coming of the Mashiach Sekeno now. Again, thank you very much for listening. And uh, let's hope that these wishes come true. We bless you all with happiness, health, and success in all that you do. And uh, may God answer all of your prayers. Shabbat Shalom, and thank you very much for attending.